one of the stories, and I wrote down the title, Why Lawyers Make Good Coaches. <laughs> and it's an extremely good story because it always impressed me that uh, I don't know how much or if John Cooper's played or even how much you played, but it, it really isn't that important. It, it It's having all the tools that go into what it requires. So I'm looking forward to editing that. But one person that we didn't get to introduce her, we'll get her to introduce <laughs> to you, Kim McCullough is on, and you might know Kim. Oh, uh, I know Kim. Yep, probably recruited a few <laughs> of her players. But uh, she may not have to tell you too much about herself. You know her that well. But uh, Kim, if you could introduce yourself and, and if you have any questions or thoughts or anything to add, go ahead. Well, yeah, thanks, Wally. Matt and I go way back, so, um, and I've I've been out to Kingston a couple times to uh, learn from Matt, so I've done that with my own professional development, I guess. Um, but you know, I think a couple things jumped out at me. You know, I I one of the things I like most about Matt is that his dad is always around and helping out, and it reminds me a lot of me and my dad's relationship. And and I I know uh, one of the other PWL Peter Bridgel coaches had the same thing, Jeff out in Cambridge. And uh, I just, I, I love that piece of it. Um, I'm very fortunate to have that. And I always, uh, I always uh, say that our, you know, Matt, Matt and I are, our dads are really running the show. We're just the puppets, you know, we don't, we don't really know what's going on. Uh, the old guys are getting it done, but, uh, and yes, Matt has actually, he'll have three of my former players, I think next year and three great ones, great people and, and great hockey players. Um, and the things that always, struck me with Matt or, or the professionalism, which he alluded to and the integrity, um, you know, so the way things are done at Queens are, are done that way because of Matt. And um, I always think uh, when my players ask me about, about Queens and, and uh, the potential of going there, I always think it's a, a great opportunity for them. But I did have a question for you, Matt, because yeah. um, you spoke about being calm under stress. And that's something that I, I'm also quite good at. Uh, but I find that my players are not quite good at. Uh, so, you know, we might uh, serve as examples for them, uh, role models for them. But uh, I find quite often when, you know, the fit hits the shan, as they say, uh, I tend to go to one place and be quite centered and like loving it. Meanwhile, they're in panic mode. Uh, so I think I take for granted that that's part of my personality and I'm very comfortable in those you know, murky waters and they're not. So how do you, other than setting a good example for them, how do you help teach them that? Cause you know, some of them may go on to be lawyers, but they haven't done it yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So any, any advice on, I, I know you're coaching players that are slightly older than mine, um, but you know, still in the relatively same age group. So yeah. any suggestions? Great to see you. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, you're totally right. Um, you know, my, my dad is the unofficial mayor of wherever he happens to be at the moment and uh, is uh, has been a great inspiration for me. And, and I'm certainly lucky and fortunate that my parents moved to Kingston and uh, that I can include him in this part of the journey. So um, and also back to you with with respect to your program. I and mean, there's a reason why, you know, we've we've had, you know, a few uh, former players of Kim's on our team is because I recognize you know, the development that they get before the next level. And that's a huge, huge part um, for me when I'm recruiting players is, uh, um, you know, I, I don't want to spend all kinds of time working on their attitude or their work ethic. Um, you know, I just want to get them into our systems and get going. And um, it's it's been a pretty consistent um, attribute, I guess, of the players that have been coached by Kim and by, uh, that, that they're ready to go. You know, I don't have to... Uh, I don't have to worry about those things. So um, to your question, yeah, great question. I mean, it's a great question. And, and you know, by example, do, what your be do your best to lead by example. And that does, you know, after after a little bit of time, that does rub off. They see how I react and, and then uh, how I hold them accountable if they don't react in a similar way. And so, you know, that does take some time with some players. Some some of them get it after a couple of days. Some of them, it, it takes almost four or five years to get them there. But um, but that whole that whole concept of uh, 
and, and uh, I'll take a step back. It also affects, I think, how I recruit. Like I, I try to get as much information I can about players and and do my best to get players that I think, you know, sort of fit that mold from from the outset. Um, but it, it's it's that whole calming the brain. And there's there's I guess the different parts in in of hockey that, that that'll come to play. I mean, there's after a tough shift and uh, they get onto the bench and they're just riled up. Right. They're either internally um, just just wired or they're, you know, chatting to their or complaining to their teammates or to the coaches. You, you just see that they're they're going a mile a minute. Um, so that's one part of it. Um, but the other part is just calming the brain on the ice. Right. And I'm sure you guys have probably touched on this with with other uh, talks that you've had about, um, you know, just trying to slow the game down and, and uh, create space in your brain so you can create space on the ice. And uh, and that's and I think they're linked. I think if you can teach your athlete to uh, to slow things down from that perspective or calm the brain, I think you're going to have benefits on the bench in the dressing room, but also on the ice in the middle of a shift. Um, I'll be honest with you, Kim, I'm, I'm constantly chasing that golden goose. Like I, I we, we've worked on uh, bringing in um, mental skills coaches. I've probably read every book on the subject that I can think about. Um, there's, there's, you know, basic ones like breathing techniques on the bench and, and uh, you know, getting them to the into the green and when they start getting into the yellow and the red. And every player has a different technique to do that and takes different time to do that. So I think that that's one thing that I have learned is that I think when I was when I was uh, trying to tackle this early, I was trying to to do a sort of one size fits all what seems right for me kind of approach. And uh, and that's I think that's maybe 50 percent of it. But um, the other 50 percent is really trying to drill down and get to know the player and, and find find out um what what gets them into the red and you know hopefully what can get them down into the green and some of them just need to be left alone just like a pat on the shoulder um um or just you know just to just walk over to them and just quickly say you know change channels or or whatever buzzword maybe you've worked out with them others require you know in between periods you you take them and the assistant coach aside and you just have a quick little 30 or 40 second talk and some of them require a full on hour long meeting, you know, with them and your assistant coach sometime during the week to talk about it. So it's 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 kind of a blend of trying to find those general ideas that are out there and, and basically give them a toolbox to hopefully choose from and some ideas that they haven't used before. But also, you know, trying to drill down and, and seeing what you can do on an individual basis. But I, I can't I can't honestly point to one thing and say, here's here's the answer. Um, I think it's it's kind of a combination of all those, but it starts with here's here's my expectations, here's why I think those expectations are beneficial for you and the team, and obviously modeling that behavior to the best of my ability. Matt and Kim, I I just want to interrupt because Dave King used to send me to the theory certification clinics. Now it's not like going to law school and practicing it, but it is the highest formal form of education required if you're going to coach on an Olympic team. And I went to Toronto and sat in on two modules, mental training for coaches and a separate model, mental training for athletes. Um, I took that module back home and incorporated it in my high school phys ed curriculum, grade 10, 11, and 12. And then I applied it in teams I coached. And I basically volunteered to take over a high-level ringette team because I was coaching my daughters at the younger age group. It's totally for the reason of completing the task required to get past those modules. Uh, both teams won the national championships that year. I accredit it to the module, which was totally based on uh, emotional control. And it applies to coaches and applies to athletes. So Without getting into it, I'd be, you know, be happy to Kim to share share that stuff with you. And I may have already shared part of it with you, Matt, but mm -hmm. I do I do have it. It's one of those toolbox things that I've always tried to give away. But when you're in the heat of the battle coaching, uh, it's really hard to absorb information and practice it until you've lived it yourself. And I had time to do that, so. 
that's just something I had to offer. Go ahead, Kim. And uh, any other? Well, yeah, I just had a, a sort of to follow up on that. I, I was listening to a podcast yesterday with uh, Dan Church. Uh, it's actually a re- it's a really good podcast. My friend started it. I started coaching with her. It's called Coach Life 2.0. She's been interviewing a lot of um, coaches in in the female game, in female sport in general, for the most part. So Ken Dufton's on there, Lisa Haley, uh, uh, MJ, who runs it, uh, used to coach with me at peak way back in the day. But uh, when I was listening to the recording with Dan last night, um, he was talking about the evolution of, of the female game and sort of he's been around it, uh, I guess, similar timeline as Matt, but, um, you know, sort of that, that first wave of elite level players coming in the late nineties, you know, when we started and, and I would, I don't know if I'd call myself elite, but I would put myself in that group of the first wave. Um, and since then the skill level has gone up exponentially in the, in the female game. And I think, you know, anyone who's been in the female game would agree with that. Uh, and Dan's comment in the podcast was that, those who had elite level mental game back then would still have that elite level mental game now. Whereas, you know, the, the elite level skill we possessed in the late nineties probably doesn't translate quite as directly to now. Right. So that those mental skills are a little bit more uh, transferable across, um, you know, the ages of women's hockey. Uh, But I was curious, you know, from your perspective, Matt, especially getting players, you know, out of programs such as ours, you know, coming in, you know, what is, I, I'm constantly telling players the advantage of having that strong mental game when they go to the next level, right? So, you know, I'm doing junior to university, uh, but anyone else here could be going, you know, uh, university to pro or, you know, pro to Olympic team or whatever that looks like, you know, um, how have you seen players adjust mentally in that way? And, and the players who already have those, like you said, the toolbox, what's the advantage that that gives them? Um, you know, from a, a performance perspective when they were a rookie or a freshman? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not overly measurable um, per se, but, but you know it when you see it, I suppose. And um, I, I agree. Like, I think that the, now, even 10 years ago, most teams had one or two lines, for example, that were kind of high end or, or good skill. And then the third and fourth lines were uh, were ones that could be picked on, basically. Um, now, most teams have depth to have four solid lines. And the skill level is, is really, um, you know, crunched into the middle, if I can put it that way, or raised to the point where it's, you know, there, there's not a lot separating um, a good fourth liner from a good second liner at this point. So, um, yeah, those those uh, not soft skills, but those those other areas become even more crucial than I think in previous years. So, um, I mean, sleep, nutrition, um, but I think the the mental skills remains. It's got to be one of the one of the one of the top, and and it is a huge huge focus for us. Um, you know, we've got a we've got a full time, actually two full time mental skills coaches uh, that are available to the players, either one on one or um, as a team. And then we've also uh, just added in the last year a mental health coach. And I found that's made a huge difference, huge difference, because I think those things used to be kind of bundled in. And so you'd have a mental skills coach trying to deal with resiliency or mental toughness. And and really, you've got a player that's suffering from anxiety, and and there's overlap, absolutely. But um, I found that's been a bit of a game changer for us. So um, we can make referrals to our mental health coach, and she is dealing with issues like anxiety, uh, depression, um, and and it's a bit more of a clinical. And 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 at that point, I am hands off. Like it is. I might be involved in the mental skills coach approach and, and, and what they're going over. But as soon as it gets into the mental health, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the referral, but then it's almost become a doctor patient scenario. And so I think that's, that was a critical separation of things, I think for us. Um, And so, uh, I mean, the mental part is, is in my mind, it is just as important as uh, you know, what our what our breakout is and what our X's and O's are and and I I would say we probably spend as much time 
talking to the players as a team and individually about their mental approach to the game as we do, again, talking over systems. It's, uh, and again, I'm, it's kind of, as a head coach, you're kind of uh, jack of all trades, masters of none. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I know what I know and from experience and I've read and learned and all the different seminars and programs and other coaches. Uh, but I'm certainly happy that we have dedicated people that will, uh, you know, will take the ball the, the rest of the way. Um, and there's no doubt, I mean, there's, there's, uh, again, with skill level being, um, so tightly bunched right now, the players that have that mental toughness, that resiliency, um, that, um, you know, practice areas like, uh, uh you know, imagery, uh, um, just, just areas like that. And again, it's, it's not a one size fits all, um, but players that that have that edge are um, there's no doubt they're they're consistently um, some of our top players and it's no secret that they eventually become our captains and our leaders and uh, and and players that I mean I've had players that that have been here for five years and they've struggled with it the whole time and they just it it you know there's there's a lot of unfortunate um, untapped potential if uh, if they can't add that part to their game. I think it's great that you have a mental health coach. I, I agree. Those are two separate things that probably have been looped together. And and I, you know, I, I think it's great. You know, we have so many resources. I think back to when I played and I, there were no skills coaches. Like you went to hockey camp or you had a hockey coach, right? There was no, you know, um, skills coach per se, or certainly mental skills coach. And I wonder how much of that now is, you know, like if I go to a skills coach to work on my shot, right? My parents pay the money. It's a X amount of dollars. It's scheduled, whatever, versus me doing it on my own, out of my own volition, you know, out of my own creation of what that skills program looks like. And the, you know, I would argue as a coach, I'm more impressed by the person who's doing it on their own, who's come hmm. up with their own program. While, you know, the, the skills instructor will be able to give, you know, those cues. And I think the same goes for the mental side. Right. And I'm I'm similar to you. I'm constantly filling their mental toolbox. We're doing breathing. We're doing imagery. We're doing visualization. You know, we're watching video. Um, but I think the ones who really get ahead on it, no different than are no different than the players doing extra skill stuff out of their own, you know, self-direction. Right. So, you know, I can go to a mental skills coach and say, fix me. Just like I can go to a skills coach and say, fix me. Yeah. Versus me actually fixing myself and I think that's whether it's hockey performance or mental performance I think that's the difference and the you know and again the players I've seen who are you know truly elite on the mental side are the ones who are doing you know the visualization before the game or you know writing their goals down or doing they're not waiting for coach Kim to say okay guys here's our visual like I think yeah. it's great that we're filling that toolbox but I wonder how much we're becoming over-reliant on specialists, right? To say, oh, you've got to do this or you've got to do this or you're not, you know, I, I think of in yeah. Toronto, how many kids only ever do skills with a skills instructor and the A, the amount of money this must cost <laughs> and B, I am also one of those skills instructors. So I'm in some ways okay with it. But like, I just, I don't think I ever went to a skills instructor other than going to hockey camp. Like, yeah. You know, like, so I just think it's an interesting concept. And I think it's great that we we keep giving these athletes the resources and access. Um, and I think it's necessary. But I I, I hope we don't lose that self-starter, self-directed work. Um, and because I still believe those are the those are the athletes who are getting ahead, even when all these resources are out there now yeah. um, that weren't there for us, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, it's it's. Uh... It's the theory of skill acquisition, and you've got to struggle through it and, and FIO figure it out on your own, and that's when it that's when it becomes more ingrained, more of a habit, and uh, as opposed to do this, right? And uh, I, I agree. I think that that works for both physical skills and for uh, for mental skills as well. Um, you know, your point about physical skills. Now, I mean, there's there's you can you can literally look up in you know in, in a minute how to how to skate, how, how to take a shot. Like it's, there's, there's certainly, and I may not help 
folks like yourself that that uh, run programs still physically, but um, you know you can you can find anything you want on the internet now. Now some of it's bad information, some of it's good, but yeah, th- these players could easily, or certainly a lot more easily, uh, um, you know, develop the the physical skills on their own. And uh, you know, I, the mental part. I mean, you can read some TED talks or go on. I mean, there's stuff out there, but I, I your concept is. Or, or thought is is bang on. I I uh, again I found that those players that come to me that have already thought about the mental side of the game have already searched out um, what works for them, trial and error. Um, they're they're ready to go. And uh, I still I still feel it's part of our responsibility to to uh, remind them of the importance of skills training. I think I still think it's part of our responsibility to give them options. Absolutely, it's part of our responsibility to remain there if they or if we observe some issues or a struggle or if they see, you know, reach out and, and ask for help for it. Um, but if there's a way to, you know, let them come to that that point on their own, I think that 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 carries more weight. I agree. I just want to mention one thing. Um, I've always felt the sports psychologist has to be you. And uh, you may have somebody to work with you, but how you coach, you are the one affecting how they're going to feel, how they're going to control their mindset. And so all of the tools will probably come from you. Uh, The idea of handing off the mental training side to a specialist, this is usually what occurs. And I think the ability to be able to, from the get-go, create a a routine of uh, dealing with adversity and coping with adversity, this is available, done in the first early part of the season and reviewed again at Christmas, two sessions. It works. And... Uh, I just say, Dave King used to say, the players don't need a sport psychologist, the coaches do. (laughs) The stress on coaching at the competitive level, um, it's amazing. And I'm looking at what's happening right now with the Calgary Flames and the mental trainer that I know, Dr. Matt Brown, who's at the ed school. And I wonder whether he's even involved in the Uh, nuances of all that's going on there but you know the business hockey that's one thing I'm more concerned about the the educational side the student athlete side and the growth and development side here but excellent uh, Kim and uh, Matthew